Chester Thompson. We're going to talk a little bit about playing the drums, and more importantly, we're going to talk about playing music. Uh, I'll start with a few exercises. Um, some things are general. Some apply to specific areas. We'll talk a little bit about how to relate to the other musicians on stage. We'll even talk a little about how to learn new parts. Uh, there's a lot more things to talk about, far too many to try and list them all here. So I'll tell you what, grab your sticks. I've got mine. First of all, we'll start with what to do with the sticks, how I use my fingers and things to build up the hands. All right, the way that I hold my sticks, I'm using the fingers. Uh, the thumb is on top. It's more of a timpani grip. Uh, the wrist starts the stroke, but the fingers tend to do most of the work. Uh, I'll get into a little more detail in just a moment with that. Uh, the timpani grip, I find, works best for getting around the toms. When I'm playing on the snare directly, uh, I tend to turn the thumbs a little bit to the side, especially for playing a roll. I'm also finding when I play hockey rinks, when I'm playing really loud and really hard, I tend to keep the thumbs more to the side because it cuts down on the amount of shock that the thumb gets. I find if I play with the thumb dead on top and play a lot of rim shots, it's you know quite a lot of abuse. So what I've found, and I still the fingers are doing the, the work, when I do a rim shot, it's more like this. And I find when the fingers do that, the hands don't feel beat up by the end of the night, which you know, so I don't get the lumps and the, the big knots that I used to get on my hands. Uh, I work a lot on controlling the amount of strokes I can handle with each stick. I guess the one thing to be clear on is when you're bouncing and when you're not. Uh, bouncing, obviously, the stick's doing most of the work. You just... When you want to increase the speed of the bounce, all you do is just tighten the grip just a tiny little bit and bear down with the thumb. That takes care of that. That's a little different from actually snapping it with the fingers, which is... There are some rudiments I use that I find really helpful for playing a drum kit and just for the way that I play, there are things I have found over the years build up my hands. Uh, paradiddles tend to be everybody's favorite, which is right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Uh, my favorite way to deal with it is with a single, double, and triple. Uh, the book will have a very detailed sticking pattern, but I'll give you a quick demonstration of the exercise I use, which is single. Double. I call this a triple, but it's actually four strokes in front of the paradiddle, but the accent makes it a triple, okay? Now just go back and forth, single, double, triple, double, okay? find that a real good warm-up. You start to feel it right in the wrist. A quick note about that, a uh, couple of the, pro the exercises I am going to show you, the wrists are going to hurt, okay? Expect that. Uh, try to relax. When the wrists start to hurt, only play a few seconds more. Don't just, you know, you can really damage your muscles, okay? Uh, play into the pain just, I'd say, no more than five or six seconds unless you're some kind of weirdo. But other than that, I think it's really better to back off, okay? Uh, flams are the other thing I use most. I'll show you how I use them. I be, your, first, your basic flam is uh, your flam tap, uh, flam triplet. And the thing is just to make it a little more interesting, it's just instead of just doing that. So you get things like to do fives and sevens. Uh, your fives are two, three. Your sevens, two, two, three. So the flam works this way. You'll see in the book that there's a lot of repeat sticking with one hand. Uh, the problem with that is very often, if you haven't been playing that long, one hand's usually weaker than the other. Uh, there are some things I do specifically to build up the weaker hand. Uh, one is a simple thing, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, which is, and by the way, everything we're talking about, any kind of exercise practice, should always start slowly, gradually build up the speed, and 
more important work on dynamics, man. Just do it loud, soft, you know, and really get extreme with it. So you, when you transfer this stuff to the kit, you can really make your playing that much more dynamic in general. Uh, but the 8765432 is this way. I find that to be a pretty effective way of, of increasing the hand strength. Forget that you heard the little blooper in the middle, don't worry about it. Uh, the other thing I find that works just as well is to repeat patterns from the stronger hand to the weaker hand. It's like you're challenging the weaker hand, okay? So you can start off with simple things. thing I find to really make it that much more strong is to incorporate accents in that, okay? So you, you do things like... And just get more elaborate as your own abilities allow you to do. You can use the same concept with the feet, by the way. Uh, what I mean is you can do things with the hands, a simple pattern at first. And we'll get a little bit more into working with the feet later, but right now there's a couple of more things with the hands that I want to deal with. Uh, one of which is working with flams. There's still much more you can do with flams to strengthen the hands and increase speed and accuracy and all that. Uh, you good old flam paradiddle, which is... Uh, and you can, you can basically, the same thing I did earlier, a single, double, triple, you can do it with flams in front now, so you can now go... Uh, there's another thing I like a lot. If I don't have much time before a show, I gotta get the job done quick. I do paradiddles with all flams, okay? So what happens is... Guaranteed pain when you do that one. Uh, one more thing with flams I wanna show you I've been working on, just purely to be able to do it, because the first time I tried it, I couldn't do it, and my belief is what to practice is what you can't do. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a series of flam triplets around the kit, um, alternating, I'm going. And in this case, I'm actually gonna jump with this, and the stick that finished is actually gonna lead, so it's gotta, you gotta have some pretty smooth arm action happening here, so you've got. Go back the other way. I do believe some things should be done just because they're hard to do, and when you can do them, you feel good about it, and when you run into something else hard to do, you're already conditioned for it. It doesn't throw you as badly. There's a lot of other things we can do uh, with paradiddles. There's a, I mean, one of my favorite things is just randomly play, play paradiddles around the kit, but there's a better way to get started doing that. I realize some guys, if they haven't done that, it's a little tricky. What I mean is, first of all, things like... <laughs> That's all simple paradiddles. It's all right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Uh, I found a pattern that might be a good way to get used to doing that kind of thing, which is this. Simply go... Again, that was all paradiddles. Everything is right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. I want to show you one more way to work with that, and that's a slight variation. A uh, thing I got from Jim Chapin, he works a lot with a thing called a windmill, which instead of playing it right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, you go right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left. 
So what I'm gonna do is put the two together. First play two paradiddles and then two windmills, okay? So you get. Just tricky enough to make you work on it. When you can do things like that, you'll just find that when your own ideas come on the spur of the moment, you're able to do them because you've got enough of a repertoire of what to do with the sticks that you don't get in a jam. Uh, I wanna go to a, things now that apply more to the whole drum kit, especially, first of all, the snare and the bass drum. Starting with the same paradiddle principle again, the right foot will substitute for the right hand. Uh, when I do this, I keep time on the, the hi-hat, so it gets to be something like, Now, the, this leads into an exercise I do to increase being able to do things in a spontaneous way so I don't get hung up thinking about what I'm doing and end up missing the opportunity to do something that could have been nice. Uh, I'm going to start with simple paradiddles like I just started, but then I'm going to randomly go into just random patterns between the snare and bass. The trick with this thing is to never stop. Don't leave any rest whatsoever. Even if you leave a 16th rest, it becomes much easier. It's very non-musical because S music is about space, it's not about filling up all the notes yourself, okay? But it's a great exercise for increasing your coordination and, and being able to do it as you think of it. And it goes sort of like this. And again, start slowly and gradually speed it up. Now remember, the same thing applies. Start slowly, gradually get faster. Don't practice any of this stuff or anything else faster than you can play it smoothly and evenly. Uh, you'll get fast and sloppy, and that's what you'll get. You won't get much work, but you'll be real fast and real sloppy to go with it. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the feet. I do a lot of clinics, and one of the biggest questions I get is how to develop the feet. Uh, the first thing I've noticed uh, a couple of times I've stood around behind guys who were having trouble with their feet and I've noticed the same thing that applies with the hands. I'm assuming by now you know that when you hit a drum you snap the stick back. Uh, the same thing applies to the pedal. You don't lay your foot into the pedal, okay? Uh, when you hit that pedal, you don't have to actually lift your foot up in the air. And by the way, the ankle is doing most of the work, not the whole leg. And my foot is at rest, but I'm not leaning into the head. If, I've got, if I'm resting that beater on that head, in order for me to play the next stroke, I have to actually lift the beater off the head. Uh, those, mini, those milliseconds and microseconds add up, and you've got no speed, you've got no finesse, so you've got to really get used to keeping that foot at rest, but off of the pedal. You want to keep that beater off of the head until you're ready to use it, okay? Uh, so the same things apply. I do things like paradiddles. Now, this is mainly for double pedals, double bass, but you know, we'll talk a little about single as well, but I, a paradiddle is a real good thing to practice even with the feet, so you get. Uh, the thing, the best way to practice it, i found for me, is to do it together with the hands, and that keeps the feet honest. They have to be more even that way, okay? So you get. Okay, that's, you know, it takes me about two minutes to warm up and get it completely smooth, and. I won't waste two minutes of your time on that. We'll go on to something else. You can practice it yourself. Okay, uh, to get better feet, do it over and over, just like anything else. If you're watching TV, set up a pedal and a pad. And notice I'm still flexing that foot. It's still coming back after I've hit the pad. I'm not doing, I'm not laying into it like that because then I'd actually have to do twice the work, but I'm actually flicking it with the ankle. And then once you get that comfortable, and the same applies to doubles, you just do single strokes all the time, you know. Uh, the biggest difference about doing double pedal work, though, is it's real crucial that you become balanced on your stool, okay? You don't want to be leaning one way or the other and actually resting on the foot, because if you're resting on the foot, then every time you lift it, you're going to be off balance, and it's just not going to flow. So you want to make sure that you can sit very comfortably, feet off the pedals completely and not be in any danger of falling over one way or the other. That'll keep your balance together for learning double pedal stuff. Uh, single strokes obviously is the place to start. Do simple rhythm patterns for the, you know, for the single pedal. Things like maybe a shuffle pattern to start. A 
basically what it comes down to really is using your own imagination. Uh, think of things like just simple patterns, right? Basically, anything that you can't do, especially if you can't do it comfortably, that justifies practicing it. The reason we practice is to get better. If you only sit around and entertain yourself by playing the things you already can play well, then you entertain yourself, which is fun, but you don't grow as a player, and that's the name of the game. If you're going to put in the time practicing, you might as well get something out of it. Uh, I'm going to move on a little bit, and I want to finish up with a coordination exercise. This is like a four-way independence thing. I'm going to start with a real straight beat, uh, just real very straight 4-4 four, four beat. With each limb, I'm going to do a 3 against 2, and it goes this way. The way to ensure that you're getting an even three against two with that, just a little note for your, for your records anyway, the way to play a really even, clean triplet is to think six. Don't think three, think six. In other words, if you need a triplet, think six, like... Now, if you really want to improve your coordination and your independence, if you play right-handed normally, set up your kit left-handed. If you play left-handed, set up your kit right-handed. That's one of the best ways I know of to actually, you know, expand your way of doing things, really improve the four-way independence. Now what we want to do is we've talked about all these different things. Let's apply some of it. You know, there's all these technical things, but there's also attitudes, which is really important. Let's look at playing different styles and the attitudes that go with them. That obviously is looking at things from a more of a funk kind of, atti kind of attitude. Uh, we're getting into the area now where you, maybe you can read music, which is great, and you can write things out, but there's always that one thing you can't quite write out on a chart, and that's the attitude thing I'm talking about. Uh, you can write down sixteenths on the hi-hat and, you know, in quarter notes or whatever, and you get... But it makes a difference whether you're phrasing it this way playing it real tight and straight like or it's you know whether it's eighths or whatever you get this kind of thing versus you know you get this versus this this is getting into the area where you get into the styles of music the things where you know, you go start going crazy with A&R men and record deals and that kind of thing because they want very clear-cut styles. I think it's to your advantage as a drummer to at least have some kind of understanding of those styles. The best way that I know of is to understand a little bit about dance. Uh, drums traditionally, other than for communication, have been used for dance. I think you'll find it very helpful to explore what kind of dance usually goes with the style of music you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about more ethnic things like Brazilian, African, things like that, you got to do a little research maybe and maybe go to the library or something and try to see films of, of the authentic dances that go with things or watch your favorite TV shows, your video shows or 
Video dance is probably a bit more stylized than what people do in the street and in clubs. But at some point, you really do have to make some attempt at understanding that. Uh, to maybe give a more clear example of attitude change, we're now going to play a rock kind of feel. But it, the difference is not so much in the notes I'm playing, but in the attitude that we try to accomplish. Check this out. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to some friends of mine that are helping me out with this video. On keyboards, we have Michiko Hill. And on bass, we have Pee Wee Hill. And an old friend of mine on guitar, John Goodsall. Now, having discussed attitude, uh, there are things that make up those, you know, the differences in attitude. You've heard uh, the, the two pieces of music, the biggest difference is being the use of the hi-hat, one being a very tight sort of straight hi-hat, one having more of a loop, sorry, more of a lope, and uh, you know, having more of a bounce to the feel. There's also other elements, things like whether you play on top of the beat or behind the beat. The simplest way to explain them being uh, if you take the same tempo and you play it in a way that it almost feels like it's rushing, it feel, has a very aggressive edge, that's normally uh, playing on top of the beat. You can play that exact same tempo, not really slow down, but make it feel more relaxed and it feels about to slow down. Uh, that's playing behind the beat. That's, that's the best way I know of to explain those things so that you can recognize them when you hear them and, or when you're playing them yourself. There's other elements as well. Uh, one thing that crops up in Latin music is playing upbeats. Uh, a lot of Western music, we tend to think down. The time is like right here, one, two, three, and we play. But then within Latin music, uh, especially Brazilian like sambas and stuff, it's a very different thing. There's an upbeat feeling, and that's quite different from the normal Western approach. So if the tempo is here, one, two, three, four, you're actually hearing and feeling it this way. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The biggest difference in that is that instead of playing it and feeling it on the downbeats, which would feel like this, one, two, three, four. I'm playing, I'm counting one, two, three, four, but I'm thinking all upbeats. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And you can apply that in things other than just Latin. Uh, sometimes, even if you're playing like a fusion thing, you can really use an upbeat to give it more of a brighter, upbeat kind of feel, like things like... Uh
that tends to make everything bounce and dance a little more. Uh, so it's just one more thing you can draw from, something to have a little more variety, a little more spice in your playing. Uh, I've actually spoken with other guys, musicians other than drummers, and I've spoken with a few friends and asked them, uh, what would you want drummers to hear to be more fun to play with? Most of them that I've spoken with, especially keyboard players, feel like drummers should be able to play more grooves, uh, pay attention to the feel more, not so much flashy feels or, you know, not playing every four bars, throw in a feel or throw in your best licks, but get more into the essence of the tune, learn how to play a groove. Most, most people feel like that's what they would really want to have happen. Uh, some guitarists, I find, uh, feel like because guitar is the kind of instrument it is, as soon as guitar starts taking a solo, the drummer starts wailing away instead of giving him time to build up his solo. Any soloist, in fact, I think would really appreciate you giving him some space in the beginning of the solo, and as he increases intensity, yeah, match him and push him even, not necessarily try to duplicate every note he plays. It's his solo, not yours. You're the accompanist, you have to remember that. But give him room to breathe. Don't just immediately jump in and start wailing all over the place because you got a fiery guitar player to work with. Give him a chance to get the spotlight, you know, without getting in his way. Uh, you know, there's so many things about me. That's why things like dynamics become real important. Uh, if you finish, if you're playing like a fusion situation or even a rock or, you know, whatever, a lot of times at the end of a solo, if there's two solos in a row, or especially if it goes from solo to vocal, the things we talked about earlier, like practicing your dynamics, they become real important. For example, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, if I'm playing a really strong section and I get to the end of that section and something else new needs to happen, then I've got to bring it down. It's easy enough to accomplish things like this. By doing things like that, it makes your playing a lot more dynamic. Uh, if you think about it, it's relative, okay? Loud is compared to soft. But if you're doing everything at one level, then you get, you know, there's no change. It just, before, after a while, everybody's kind of ears are burned out and it's just not very musical. So those, those are the kind of things you want to work on. Playing a groove requires that you can play steady, time. Uh, the most frequently asked question I get in clinics is how do you play solid time? Um, again, that's getting into what I call getting to the essence of the tune. Uh, and just lock into a groove and just, just wear it out. Um, sometimes in a lot of today's music, you really don't get to play much more than sort of four on the floor bass drum. But if that's the case, don't have an attitude and balk about it. If that's what you got to play, play it the very best you can play it. That's the whole point of the thing, and, and play it in a way that it makes people want to move, you know, not just sort of sit there and be bored. You know, that, that's the kind of things that, that make it more fun uh, for other people to play with a drummer. Um, you know, those, those are the kind of things, just general musicianship, that you will find, I think, will get you, if not more work, the work that you're doing, I think people will enjoy a lot better and be that much more anxious to call you back. Uh, one way to learn to play more solid time and play better grooves, you do need to practice with a drum machine, okay? In fact, all of the things, I say drum machine really meaning metronome, but these days it's normally a drum machine used as a metronome. Uh, even the things we talked about practicing early, they really all should be practiced, uh, except for the things that you're going to accelerate. But until you get them down, you really do want to practice with some sort of a metronome or click so that you develop real solid time. Over the years, I've kind of developed a way of practicing with a metronome to sort of lock in my being able to do it. But also, hopefully, what I want to accomplish is to be able to play freely and make it feel good, even though I'm playing with a click or a metronome. What I'm going to do is demonstrate that for you. Basically, the essence of, of this particular exercise is I'm going to play along with the click. Then gradually, more and more, I'm going to move away from the click, hopefully always coming back to it. I'm not just guessing where the click is. I'm really counting it the whole time.
that, that can obviously get a little tricky, so I would advise you to very slowly take it out. Uh, don't just sort of jump right in and start wailing all over the place, but as you get used to doing that, like I said, you will find yourself having a little more freedom to relax when you're playing with a click track. At this point, I'd like to talk about something that's probably a common problem to all of us. How do you go about learning new material? You're gonna join a new band, maybe it's your first band, but what do you do to prepare for that? Uh, first of all, preparation-wise, if at all possible, I ask for a cassette or charts or something because I don't wanna walk in cold. I try to get familiar with the material as much as possible. It, you at least need tapes to be able to do that. When you're listening to the tapes, what do you listen for? Don't just listen to what beat went here and how many bars. Try to learn to identify sections of a song. Uh, become familiar with what the verse is or the chorus. Even if you don't know what to call the sections, just listen so that you'll know this section is the same as that section that happens later on, so you know you'll use this pattern or you know it goes with this many bars. Uh, and start looking at things that way. Look at the structure of the songs, not just uh, the drummer played this beat this long. And also when you're listening to what the drummer did, if in fact you know there is already drums on the tape, don't just listen to all the notes. It's real important if you can make yourself listen to the spaces as well. A lot of times that's where the, the trick is and what didn't get played as opposed to everything that did get played. Uh, you know, charts, again, uh, learn to read music as groups of notes. You don't read words, uh, you don't spell every letter, you don't go C-A-T and D-O-G. You learn to recognize words. There are certain rhythm patterns you need to learn to recognize in the same way you recognize words. I've kind of broken those down into what seems to me, uh, in my experience, to be the main four rhythm patterns. Uh, these happen over and over and over in contemporary music in different combinations. Uh, you might see them presented in different ways, but these seem to be the main patterns. Uh, just to quickly show you what I mean, and they'll be notated for you in your book, you got one which goes this way, one, two, three, four, one, four. Okay, you got one which goes two, three, four. Uh, you got two others. One is one, two, three, four. And maybe sometimes it's twice as fast. Uh, the other one is pretty much the opposite of that. You got four. Uh, I think if you learn to recognize those in their different forms, a lot of times they're going to be tied together. You got to learn how to read uh, ties and stuff. Uh, it does help to have a teacher sometimes, or if you're good about studying in a book, then you want to learn how to deal with that yourself. It's kind of hard to go into a lot of length and detail about how to read uh, ties and dotted notes. But I think if you learn to recognize those main patterns, I think you'll be in a lot better shape as far as learning how to pick up on new music. Because even if there's no charts, if you know those patterns and can hear them clearly, when you go to write out your own chart, you'll save a lot of time because you're writing out patterns you know. You're not trying to sort of scuffle through every single note. But it's just like you're writing words, you're writing groups, phrases. And that's what you want to learn is to think in phrases, not just individual notes. I think if you learn to do those things, like I say, especially prepare ahead of time as much as possible. Don't wait until the day of when you can possibly have had a tape or, or the music for the gig. I think you'll find it a lot smoother and easier process. Okay, I guess right now is a good time to talk about odd time signatures. Uh, they don't have to be so odd. They don't have to be so mystifying, and I'll show you what I mean. If you can think in terms of doing things in groups of two and three, it takes the mystery out. You want five, it's simple mathematics, two and three. Okay, you got one, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. get into a seven, you got two, two, three. It could be three, two, two, or whatever. Normally, two, two, three uh, is, is the way it gets done, which is one. Now, you can 
apply the same thing to nines, to elevens, to thirteens. A nine these days is probably going to be like a four and a five, which still gets back to twos and threes. So you got one, two, one, two, that's your four. Then you got one, two, one, two, three, that's your five. So you got one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. So anyway, to further illustrate the point, uh, we're going to play another song for you. It's a song called Go, and it goes back and forth from five to four. Now, the, one of the key things about this, when you get into time signatures where they move back and forth, you want to keep the same pulse, okay? So if it's five, you're not going sort of one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, you know, it's, it's all constants, like one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And you'll notice that with this song. Uh, check it out. Hopefully it clears it up for you. you've enjoyed this I have uh, we put a lot of information in it's a video you can go back fortunately and, and take out what you want record your practice sessions okay individually and with your band record your practices it, it saves you a lot of trouble you don't have to guess what you're doing you get an objective look at it it's real important that you enjoy what you do because it is hard work it takes a lot of practice so I hope you enjoy it God bless you have fun <laughs>